why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. All my life I've been told I belong at the end of the line with all the other not rights and all the never get it right. But it turned out they're the ones you were looking for all this time. Well, I'm just no. had stage fright and David brought a rock to a sword fight you picked 12 outsiders nobody would have chosen and you changed the world the moral of the story is everybody's got a purpose so when I hear that devil start talking to me saying who do you think you are well I'm just a nobody trying to tell about somebody who saved my soul. And ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. I'm waiting for the world to see nobody but Jesus. I'm waiting for the world to see nobody but Jesus. So let me go Another blood rock faithful member of the family. And if they all forget my name, well, that's fine with me. I'm waiting for the world to see nobody but Jesus. So let me go down, down, down in history as another blood rock faithful member. Fine with me. I'm waiting for the world to see nobody but Jesus. Cause I'm just nobody. I can tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. And ever since you rescued me, gave my heart a song to see. I really grew up in a very diverse neighborhood, and uh, that that's part of what led me to plant the type of church that we planted here at Gospel Hope. We wanted to plant a church in a very diverse area to say to our world that there's hope. There is gospel hope through the work of Jesus for a right relationship with God and a right relationship with one another. And we feel like the east side of Atlanta just beautifully represent that. As I was getting prepared to plant Gospel Hope Church, one of my deepest prayers was that the Lord would lead a brother to lead this plant with me. And I was praying for somebody that I would really identify with philosophically and theologically, and God in His grace answered that prayer way beyond my expectation by allowing me to meet Rod through a mutual friend. We got together and had coffee, and just as we began to get to know one another, we came to the conviction that we think we can do this better together than we can apart. We're on the same mission here. We're on the same team. And we've been able to reach a wide swath of people. And every Sunday, you have this beautiful picture of the diversity of God's kingdom. Absolutely. And people who I think their idea of what it means to win has nothing to do with, is it my idea or is it his or her idea? But does this idea or does this initiative advance the kingdom? 
people are black and white and brown and rich and poor and male and female and young and old, but fundamentally, we are all made in the image of God. We are sinners who need a savior. And we all, if we trust in Jesus, are made brothers and sisters by the work of his blood. And it is, it's, it's one of the most deeply moving experiences of my life to be a part of a church that does display the reconciling hope of the gospel. Thank you so much for giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Because of partners like you, we are able to plant churches in places that desperately need a gospel witness. And you're going to have your opportunity to give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Judy's holding up a brochure there. Uh, that the last Sunday of this month, we'll be taking a special offering for that. Of course, you can give at any time uh, in the drop-down box, giving electronically. Just choose any Armstrong uh, offering and uh, do it that way. But uh, on the last Sunday of the month, we'll be taking a special offering for that. And it goes to missions like the one you just saw about, but also missions across North America. And so it's a North American Mission Board special offering. And because your cooperative program takes care of overhead costs on a regular basis for the mission work in North America, 100% of the Annie Allen offering goes, uh, I mean, Al, Annie Armstrong offering. The Annie Allen is our Enterprise Association offering. I get mixed up sometimes. But the Annie Armstrong offering 100% of it goes directly to these mission efforts. And so we ask you to pray, to seek God's face on what he would have you to give uh, when that, uh, on the last Sunday of this month. In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe You believe that this morning? There is just one In this broken generation When all is dark you help us see There is only one salvation We believe We believe we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death, we believe in the resurrection, and He's coming we believe So let our faith be more than anthems Greater than the songs we sing And in our weakness and we believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new
We believe in the Holy Spirit And He's given us new life We believe in the crucifixion We believe that He conquered death We believe in the resurrection And He's coming back He's coming back again up again you know one of these days we're all going to stand before him church and every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess Jesus is I can't wait to see him I've got so much to thank him for Lord now Sing this. Indeed I find thy power and thine alone. Took a sinner like me can change the leper's heart and melt the heart of stone. Oh, for Jesus' name it all. everything sin and left the crimson stain he washed it white as snow oh Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin and left the crimson 
want to walk with him, stand with us. I want to walk with you, Jesus. Feel your presence and know you're near. I want to see you, Jesus. Move in
Jesus, I believe. Today, the need for apologetics, the ability to give a defense for what you do believe. Of course, we're in a series of sermons from 1 Peter, and uh, it's entitled Serious Church. And today is probably one of the most important parts or needed parts of a church being serious in our day and age. Uh, Peter is saying we need to be serious. You you know that in chapter 5 and verse 8. Be of sober spirit, he says. That means be serious. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And you don't want it to be you. (laughs) And so... Peter also uh, was in a day and age, uh, you know, past his time in Jerusalem, uh, on down the road, as it were, out being a missionary in the Gentile world. And in so doing, he was uh, uh, having to be serious because of the rise of persecution in that day and age. And so uh, he is saying to the church, it's time for us to be serious. And that's why we have picked this particular uh, book for this series of sermons on being the serious church. So today, if you will, take your Bibles and if you can, stand in honor of God's Word as we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, or do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who once were disobedient. When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. May the Lord add the blessing of his word in your lives. May you may be seated. The need for apologetics. Uh, Peter calls for us not to be intimidated by the world. He states that we should always be ready to make a defense. Now the Greek word for defense here is apogohia and uh, that is where we get the English word apology. Apology. It means uh, like in a law court. It's a word from, a, from the law court. It means uh, starting out that you give a verbal self-defense for, say, the crime you're charged with. And so you stand up to make that defense. That word now has become a theological word. Uh, you can actually go to a seminary and do a degree in apologetics. What it means is to be able to give a defense for the truth that is in you that you believe, what you believe about God and in your life. So today I would like us to think about how if we're a serious church, and we should be, 
How can we as the members of the body of Christ be ready to give a defense or give an answer or an account for what you believe? If the church is going to be serious, each and every one of us need to be willing and ready to do that. And if we are not, it weakens our influence in the world of being salt and light and having change and being able to make a difference in our world. So first, uh, I want us to look at a few things here uh, that Peter says to us in this passage of Scripture that helps us to be serious, to build, and what it takes to have an appropriate apologetic or defense for what we believe. First of all, there needs to be a Christ-centered dedication in your defense. You know, if you're not dedicated to the Lord, you can say all you want, it doesn't have much influence on people because they can see your lack of dedication. A serious church is one in which we are serious about being dedicated to the Lord. The way uh, Peter here explains it uh, in verse 15, the first part. He says, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Now I want us to think about that a minute. The word Lord in that day and age meant, a uh, simple way to say it is boss, right? Uh, Lord was the person in charge, uh, uh, whether it be government or in the household or whatever. Uh, Lord means to be in charge. He's the boss. And now, Oftentimes we talk about glorifying Christ. Uh, we glorify His perfections, His greatness, His justice. But when we sanctify Him, the word sanctified means to be set apart. Set apart. It's related to being holy. So what it means, what He's saying to us is when He says, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, it says give Him, set Him apart a special place in your heart and not just a special place but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. That means the special place that you're putting Christ in your hearts is on the throne in your heart. And that's what Lord would mean, this special place. If we're going to have a Christ-centered dedication and be serious about our defense of the gospel, we have to be serious about putting Christ on the throne in our hearts in all things. Now what does this relate to? The great commandment. You are to love God. Place Him first in all your heart, mind, soul, strength, everything that you have, right? So this is the carrying out of the Shema of the Old Testament. This is the carrying out of De the command in Deuteronomy that all of Israel loved so much that they rolled it up in a little piece of paper and they put it in a phylactery that they tied on their arm, a right arm, or their forehead so that they remember what they do. They remember how they think. They put it in uh, uh, Medusa uh, on the doorpost of their house so, and they would kiss it as they went out so they'd remember it all day long and kiss it when they came in so that they would remember it in their house. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Christ-centered dedication. Here's a question that we should ask ourselves today. Is Christ Lord of your life or are you the boss? Or your husband or wife, are they the boss? Or is your boss the boss? <laughs> Who is the boss? Are possessions your boss? Your own self-comfort, is that the boss? No, if we are to be serious as a church in our world that needs a serious church, we must put Christ as Lord in our lives and then therefore He will automatically be Lord of the church, right? So, is he Lord? Put him on the throne in your life. Secondly today, a Christ-centered education. Let me go back, it's delaying on me. A Christ-centered education. Now, what is a Christ-centered education? You see, if we're going to be serious about our commitment uh, to the Lord, 
if we're going to be serious as a church, then we must be educated in what we believe. You can't give an apology, a defense, if you don't know what you believe. So uh, he says that we need to be ready to give this defense. So in order to be ready to give this defense, you have to be ready, uh, trained, taught. So it would infer to us that what we need to happen in our lives is that we must be involved in Bible study, devotions, Bible study classes. We, we need to be uh, involved in worship, in the preaching of the word. We need to be involved in small groups when you have the opportunity. We need to involve ourselves in every single way that we can in order to know what we believe so that our defense of the gospel can be an educated defense. Now the word apology in the Greek language started out, as I said, in a law court where a person gives a self-defense, you know, explaining uh, themselves and why they did what they did. But in the day that Peter is writing, the word had primarily been changed over because of Socrates. And uh, the uh, apologia Socrates, which means that if you know your history of philosophers, Socrates uh, was uh, uh, put on trial because of his philosophy, because he was driving people crazy. And uh, he stood up and gave an apologia uh, about his philosophy and what he believed and why he did it. didn't help him. They made him drink the hemlock juice, if you recall. Now you say, why would they do that to a philosopher? Well, his philosophy went like this. Uh, 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 Jody, uh, why did you play the keyboard today? Why did the Lord give you the gift? Why did the Lord love you? Why does the Lord love everybody? Why did he die for us? You get, you get the idea? The Socratic method that Socrates used, which he would do to people in the street, is ask a question after question after question. His thought was you would eventually get to the bottom line of everything, okay? And that's what he was after, but he was driving people crazy. But that's why, that's why the word apologia has come to be used by Peter here as us being able to make a defense, to make a defense to explain why we believe what we believe. Now, the question we should ask ourselves is how well can you explain what you believe? If you're not ready, if you can't explain why, what you believe and why you believe it, that's something you need to work on. And that's why you need to be in everything you can from the Word of God because this is where we find what we believe, right? So that you know more and more about it. He said, that, as I mentioned before, he said, be ready to give this defense. Ready means training. Ready, set, go, right? Now, as we're coming up toward uh, the gospel to every home through the month of July, where we have a particular portion of our uh, part of the world here in which we're making sure that the gospel gets to every home, there's going to be training for how to do that. You need to come out so that you will be ready, right, to do this. As we look to relaunch Bible study program, there's going to be further training for teachers and outreach leaders. And, and you need to come to the training so that you might be ready, right, to do what you're going to do and many other things as well. Uh, but this is what a serious church has to do. You can't just halfway do something. You have to be prepared. And there needs, needs to be a Christ-centered uh, Christ education. And then also uh, today... There needs to be, uh, uh, well, let me put another question up here that we need to, to address today. And that is, how well are you trained to do what you need to do to give a defense? 
But then last, uh, lastly here, there needs to be a Christ-centered presentation. Now in verse 15, the latter part of that is, to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So uh, we need to have a presentation that is Christ-centered, okay? Now he, he mentioned some things in here that I think needs to be a part of our presentation to people. When somebody asks, that's what he's talking about. When somebody asks, you know, they say, hey, you didn't fall apart and everything uh, at, at this funeral the way we see other people do. Why? why? You know, hey, uh, you lost your job, but you didn't seem to lose your joy. You know, why, why is that? Uh, how, uh, somebody insulted you, but you didn't insult them back. Why, why, why do you act that way, right? We need to be ready to give an answer for that. And that answer should be Christ-centered. And in that, it should be reasonable. Uh, the word translated, give an account, uh, is the word logos. Uh, now, you're familiar with that if you've studied the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the logos, the word. And the logos was with God. And the logos was God. <laughs> But the word, the word, the logos, the word uh, used in, in the Greek world means the reason for everything. Uh, 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 the rationality. God is the reason for everything is what John was trying to say. And, and he's the beginning of all things. Uh, but here he says give an account. It's that word logos. But what it means uh, is, is that we should have a reasonable explanation a reasonable account of why we follow Christ and what he's done for us. Now, this makes your witnessing so much easier if you can do that. Because somebody comes up and says, why? Why do you act that way? Why are you that way? You just simply say, well, I want to give glory to Jesus Christ, my Savior. I want to explain to you why he, uh, I do what I do and why he wants me to act this way. For example, if you say, uh, I don't return evil for evil. Because fighting fire with fire just makes a bigger fire. It's sensible. It's rational. It's the way Christ taught us. So there should be a reasonable defense. So the question that we can ask ourselves uh, today is, uh, uh, are you ready to give a reason why you are a follower of Jesus Christ? A serious church needs to be able to, to do that. Another thing is it, it should be reliable. Reliable. Uh, you can depend on it. He says uh, to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. You know that, uh, 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 that hope in a biblical perspective is not hope so. That, that's a totally different word. Hope means I can carry on. I can know that everything's okay because I have a fixed and sure hope. It is going to happen, right? And that's what he's talking about, about being reliable. Uh, Paul says in, uh, in Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. You see, we can look in the scriptures, we can look at the prophets and, and all the things of the past and, and, and see what has already come true, that God has kept every promise that he's ever made, every prediction that was ever made by the prophets, which came from God, came true. And so the ones that are yet to come are going to come true also, right? The patriarchs looked on in hope, the poets sang in hope, the prophets declared their flaming messages in hope of the coming Messiah. Then he came, lived, died, rose again, and ascended on high to return one day to consummate all the hopes of the past, present, and future. Thou art, that should be part of our defense, that he is reliable. And then Paul also said in uh, uh, Romans uh, 5, 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. This should be 
our apology, our defense. It should be part of us giving an account. The question is, how well can you express the hope that you have in Jesus Christ? Are you able to do that when asked why you have this hope? And then he also says that a Christ-centered presentation should be one that is respectable. And this need, we need to be reminded of this. We're not the judge. You've heard me say this before. You're a witness, right? So a witness just testifies to what has happened firsthand to themselves, right? So when you go out, you're not the judge. You don't tell people you're going to burn and go to hell. That's God's job, the Father. He's the judge, the righteous judge. It's not our job to convict people. You know, to make them feel like they have to do X, Y, or Z. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He can do it very well. It's not our job to save people. You can't save anybody. If you hear some preacher or somebody say, I saved three or four people, you need to correct them. I'll remind you of Dr. R.G. Lee walking down the street of Memphis and a guy, a drunk, walked up staggering and said, Dr. Lee, I'm one of your converts. And he said, you certainly must be because you're not the Lord's. <laughs> right? Only God can save. So what is our job? To say, this is what God has done for me. To give a defense, an apology. Somebody says, why do you believe this? You say, this is why I believe it. Why do you have hope when there is no hope? This is why. Because I have hope in Jesus Christ. You witness to what he has done for you. But you do it in a respectable way. He says that we should do it with gentleness and reverence. Uh, the opposite would be arrogance and self-assertion. It should be gentleness toward people and reverence before God. And that's what Peter said we ought to be in our presentations. Uh, verse 16 in our passage today he says it very well. He says, keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. You see, in any apology, in any defense, in any witness that we give, the vital thing that's important is that we are conducting ourselves in such a way that we don't cancel out what we say. Right? Our behavior is vitally important in a serious church that seriously wants to give a defense before God of what we do. So the, the question that comes to us is, does your presentation of Christ have a good conscience toward God and a good commendation before men so that they might see your good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven? As we come to a close today and as Jody and the guys get ready uh, uh, for our closing song, I just want to remind you of how Peter ends this. We read it. You can go back and look at it, how he ends this third chapter. He reminds us of some things that are important as we are being ready to give an account to anyone who asks us about the hope that is within us to give our apology, to give our defense, to give our witness. He reminds us of some, some things that are important to keep us strong and serious in that process. First of all, he reminds us that suffering for the right is worth it. You see, one thing that might keep us from being active in giving our defense, in giving our reason for what we believe, is that we may be afraid that we might suffer because of it. Now, how, how might that look? Well, in America, it might look that you would be ridiculed, right? Made fun of. Now, let me tell you today, I will say to you that, yes, you will. Jesus was. You might be afraid that... Uh, that someone might, uh, you might lose your job because of it. I want to tell you today, yes, you might. And Jesus was, and the followers of Jesus were treated in such ways. 
you might miss out on that promotion. Oh yeah, let me tell you, you probably will. Jesus didn't guarantee us uh, an easy path. <laughs> he guaranteed us a path that was, uh, has meaning, eternal meaning, something that's part of the glory of God, something in which your rewards in heaven cannot be taken from you. He didn't promise you anything in this life, but oh my, nobody can take away what comes in the next life. Suffering for right is worth it. Now he said, if you're suffering for your own wrongdoing, then you know, good luck to you. Right? That's part of conducting ourselves the way we should so that our testimony is solid. But if you're suffering for what is right, it's worth it. And then he reminds us that Christ's suffering was once for all. His death on the cross was for our sins. And he paid it all, and all to him I owe, right? Then he reminds us that the proclaiming of the gospel is for two purposes. It is for salvation. It's also for judgment. So that in the day of Christ, that person that you did share your faith with, who rejected and turned away, they have no excuse, do they? He talked to us in verse 19 that through the Holy Spirit, Christ was proclaimed to the disobedient of Noah's day. That after his death on the cross, through the Holy Spirit, that they were reminded of the preaching of Noah. But only eight were saved. Only eight were saved. You see, the gospel is being proclaimed but only those who believe and obediently follow as baptism illustrates that he talks about. I remind you, he did not say that baptism saves you. He immediately said it is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and your faith in that. Baptism is your moving through and showing just like those uh, eight in Noah's day went through the flood. You go through the baptism of belief and you are saved. But the preaching of the gospel is to those who are saved but the gospel is preached to those who are not and so it brings us down to a very simple question today where do you stand are you saved or are you going to be judged by the gospel Jesus didn't come in this world to destroy the world but to set people free he didn't come to condemn us. We're already condemned. We're dead people walking. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so today the question comes to you. Are you saved? Or do you stand judged by the gospel? I hope and pray today that you having heard the gospel and that is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When he died on the cross, he died for your disobedience, your sin. And you stand today on your own having to decide what to do with Jesus. Will you accept him and receive that free gift of salvation and be saved and become a child of God and become a proclaimer of the apology, the defense of the gospel? Or will you go the way of all the rest at the flood? Will you go the way, as he says at the end, that even the angels are judged by Christ? Those that rebelled will be cast into the lake of fire and those that stayed faithful to God. Where do you stand today? I hope you understand that it, no matter what you've done, no matter what, where you've been, no matter what your sin, Christ died for you. And your testimony today can be I was a wretch, 
But now, I'm a wretch no more. Let's stand. The guys are going to be up front. If you've got a question, you come up. Terry, if you'll come and help Josh today, they'll, they'll help you to know how to make a decision. To, to, to accept Christ, to join this church, whatever it might be, you come and they'll help you answer. I was born in the river bed Not by mama's eyes and my daddy's head Chained me to a troubled star With wandering feet and a restless heart The only thing I knew was lost till met a rugged cross that's when Jesus reconciled and the prodigal became a child where mercy took me in Amazing grace What love divine That song of slave Wrapped up 
you glad of that truth and when you know that then you have victory in Jesus and the guys are going to send us out with that good old song